Dobro večer. Dobro večer i dobrodošli na prvi Piščev dnevnik. Ja ću sada preći na engleski. Očekujem da svi govorite engleski s obzirom da će i razgovor večera sići na tom jeziku. Welcome all. I would like to thank our partners Multimedia Institute especially for collaboration in this event. I would like to welcome our two guests tonight. David Albahari who from now on will be the host of Chronicle of a Writer, a series of uh, conversations with people who um, are important for his personal uh, artistic landscape. Uh, the first one uh, that David Albahari will talk to is Alberto Mangel, a writer, translator, editor, a man who wrote so many books that I can't really count, and, um, uh, but also a huge bibliophile, a um, person who has probably the most intriguing and interesting uh, public, uh, personal library in Europe, more than 40,000 books. Um, but also a man who is avid reader, and I think if there is one uh, word that would describe Alberto Mangel is a reader. Um, David Albahari, I don't think that needs a special uh, introduction, at least not in Buxa. Our dear friend, writer and translator from Serbia, uh, who uh, lived for a long time in Canada. Now he's sharing his time between Serbia and Canada. And uh, who will uh, host these uh, events from now on for the next, hopefully, two years uh, with other guests. Uh, without further ado, I would just like to add that this is a part of our uh, new um, issue of the um, project called Aesthetic Education Expanded. As I mentioned, Multimedia Institute is our partner, but also Kuda.org from Novi Sad, uh, uh, Contrapunkt from Skopje, and uh, Berliner Gazette from Berlin. Uh, tomorrow, uh, um, Alberto Mangel will uh, give a lecture in Galleria Nova on the um, uh, co uh, titled The End of Books, so uh, now I would like to invite you all for the lecture tomorrow in Galleria Nova at 7. Um, David, will you take over mi the microphone because I will just keep on blabbing. If you, if you, if you want to so go on. <coughs> I'm really honored uh, that I have, uh, that I can um, Talk to 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 my 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 I I I I I, I, I may say good old friend, uh, uh, in especially three. old. <laughs> yes. Well, we won't go into that now. But before I say anything anything about you, I I, I want to 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 have some some facts uh, straight. Uh, uh, Mika just mentioned your library of forty thousand books. 40,000 volumes, and uh, I have an essay where it says 30,000 volumes. So, what is the? It's an old essay. <laughs> what, what is what, what? What is the exact number? Do you know the exact number? I, I don't know the exact number. I haven't ever counted them. Once I decided to see more or less how many there were, so I calculated how many on what were on one shelf and then multiplied that number by the number of shelves. But my math is never very good. Um, by the end of this year, I will know uh, how many books I have because there's a team of librarians from Montreal who are coming to catalog the library. And then, then I will know. I, I just know that However many books I have, at the end of the day, there seem to be more. Somehow, the books reproduce themselves like rabbits. And in, 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 one, in one of your essays, you, you actually give a sort of a prediction about your life, and you say that the books will, will actually throw you out of your house, and you will have to live in your garden. There, there is a story by Julio Cortázar called House Taken Over, 
uh, were uh, a couple, an old couple of brother and sister live in this apartment. And uh, one evening they hear a noise in one of the back rooms and the brother says to the sister, oh, they've taken over that room. And slowly, whatever it is, takes over every room till they have to leave the house. Um, I feel that that's what is happening with my library. When, when we first set it up 15 years ago, um, the, the, the space allotted to the library was, was large and there were wonderful little spaces on the shelves where you could imagine the books that were going to come. And very quickly, those spaces started filling up, and then I had to move books into the bedrooms and into the kitchen and into the bathroom. And yeah, one day will come where I will have to live in the garden in a tent. But even there, the books will come. So I'm condemned to be ousted by the books. And what is the name of the, the guest room in your house? Ah, <laughs> because. Um, the books are uh, placed uh, by certain subjects. Uh, the guest room is called the murder room <laughs> because I have my detective novels in there. So it's, it's better not to, to stay overnight at your place? Uh, well, well, most guests wake up perfectly okay in the morning. <laughs> but they are surrounded by images of Sherlock Holmes and I found a wonderful engraving of the Reichenbach Falls, where Sherlock Holmes falls to his death with Moriarty. He doesn't die, of course, but uh, so it's a good place. Sherlock Holmes never, never dies. No, um, uh, Conan Doyle got so fed up with him that he tried to kill him in, in that story. And the public was so outraged that he was deluged with letters and he had to bring him back to life. And uh, you also mentioned uh, in, in the same essay on, 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 your, on your library that there is only one book that you would not allow <coughs> to become a, a, a part of your library. Well, my, my library is very eclectic and it's like a, a, an orphan's hospital, any book dropped in a basket that the door of my library is taken in, no questions asked. And I have always said that I've opened every book that has come into the library and kept them all. Because you never know when you need a bad book to give an example. I mean, I, I have, I have uh, the Da Vinci Code in my library. I. I <laughs> I, I have one novel by Paolo Coelho. I think that's a, <laughs> that's enough. Um, but um, but the one book that I threw away, and it's the only book ever that I've thrown away, is Bret Easton Ellis's American Psycho, which I had to read because I had to review it, and I felt infected by the book. I felt that his delight in describing the deliberate pain caused to another human being, especially women, he, he is especially brutal with women, um, I thought, I, I don't want this book uh, infecting the rest of my library. And of course, I wouldn't give it to someone else, so I just put it in the garbage and hoped that nobody would find it. <laughs> you, you, you don't lend, lend the books from your library? I think lending books is incitement to robbery. Um, I know myself when I have been so-called lent a book that was very important to me, I have forgotten to give it back. Um, there is the old joke of the man who shows a friend a library and um, his library and, and the friend says, well, would you lend me a book? And he says, no, I never lend books. And the friend says, why don't you never lend books? And the friend says, three quarters of the books that I hear are books that were lent to me. <laughs> and now I want to ask you about your, your identity. 
<laughs> you were born in, 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 in Israel, where your father was... Uh... It's more complicated than that. Oh, okay. Um, if you really want to hear the sad, long story. I was born in Buenos Aires, and uh, when I was two months old, my father was named the Argentinian ambassador to Israel, because at the time, this is when in 48, Peron uh, was selling passports to the Nazis who were coming into Argentina. And the Jewish community was getting really uneasy about this. So he said, well, don't complain. We will send the first Argentinian ambassador to the newly created state of Israel. And that was my father. So, um, so we left for Israel, and I lived in Israel for eight years, came back to Argentina, uh, lived there till I was 19 in Buenos Aires, then left because I wanted to travel, and I lived in uh, Spain, France, England, Italy, Germany, uh, the South Pacific. I was the only publisher in the South Pacific, <laughs> in, uh, in Tahiti. Um, uh, how, many books, uh, how many books have you published there? Oh, lots. We, we did lots of travel books and photo books, and even um, we published the first book in the Tahitian language uh, since the missionaries had published the Bible in Tahitian, and that was the collected South Sea stories of Robert Louis Stevenson. And it was wonderful because the translator into Tahitian said how extraordinary it was that Stevenson had captured the language, the Tahitian language, so well in English that when he translated it back into Tahitian, it fitted perfectly the rhythm, the, even the number of words. And of course, Stevenson had already a name in Tahitian. He was called Tusitala, which means the teller of tales. So I'm very proud of that book. So could you go on with the story of... of ah, yes, well, yeah. Um, when uh, I had lived in Tahiti for five years, I was married then, had two daughters, and then the publisher closed the company, as publishers are want or obliged to do. And then I had a choice. Uh, this was in 82. I could go and live in Japan because we printed the books in Japan and the Japanese printer wanted me to come and work for him. I could move to San Francisco where the publisher was setting up another company or I could go to Canada. And of Canada I knew absolutely nothing except that one of my books had been published there. And so we decided to go to Canada, but uh, the fates. Um, before going to Canada, we decided to go via Argentina, where my sister was getting married. We arrived in Buenos Aires in May 82, two weeks before the Falklands War. And then um, my passport, which was an Argentinian passport, was taken away. My wife at the time and my two daughters had British passports and they told us, well, you know, nothing will happen, just as probably they tell <laughs> every population before a disaster, nothing will happen. Um, and then my mother had to smuggle my uh, ex-wife and daughters to Uruguay and from there they went to, to England. Uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. Um, I couldn't get out of Argentina because I didn't have a passport. So my brother, we look quite alike. My brother lent me his document. <laughs> and so I left with my brother's document. It, it's, it's very easy to cross borders if you watch enough television. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so the long and the short of it, or rather the long of it, was that we landed in, in Canada and um, I decided to become a Canadian citizen. And one of the wonderful things that happened to me in Canada was that 
I learned about you and I was able to ask you to come and give a talk in Canada and it was one of my proudest moments. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm still in Canada but I, uh, sometimes I come to Zagreb. Yes, well I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've, this is my first time in Zagreb and I'm no longer in Canada, but uh, anyway, we, we, we are nomadic people. Uh, we are maybe not meant to uh, stay in, in one place. I'm, I'm still interested about your identity. After, 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 after leaving Argentina, you, you went to Europe or what? Yeah, well, I um, I don't believe in nationalities. I I know that this is something difficult to say in the ex Yugoslavia, but um, I don't believe, first of all, that you should be imposed uh, a nationality just because your mother happened to drop you in a certain place. Um, nor do I believe in. Uh, what we call nations or countries defined by political borders that are inventions of bureaucrats. Um, maybe there are some areas that share a common imagination, but no one has quite defined them. So uh, you could say of someone that he or she belongs to the nation of romantic Europe or adventurous America or uh, philosophical Arab countries. But even then, I, I think that there are so many exceptions that I, I don't want to be lumped with Argentinians or French people or even Canadians whom I love. Um, I, 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 if I had to find an identity for myself, I think that it, I would want it to be an identity defined by my reading. Uh, I have said a number of times that I feel that um, a library is like an autobiography that uh, you can go through the books on the shelves and, and see the books that you read at certain times, books that changed you, books that hold mementos, a slip of paper, a number, a name. And, and, and there I recognize myself and, and I can say, yes, I, I belong to this place. But in terms of nation, no. And, and I don't know if in the future we will be lucky and nations will cease to exist. But maybe I'm being overly optimistic. Not, not, no, not, not in ex Yugoslavia. Um, <laughs> well, that will be the the island in a, a, a borderless world. Now, I hope for your sake that as well borders will stop to exist. Um, maybe some uh, uh, mischievous elf should go into bureaucratic departments and change the borders. The, the, there was something that happened when I, I wrote a book called The Dictionary of Imaginary Places a long time ago with Gianni Guadalupe. And we came across a wonderful story. British cartographers um, at the end of the 19th century were mapping a section of Central Africa. And uh, the days were long and it was hot and the insects bothered them. And after a while, they said enough already. They had a large section to, to uh, a map. And they cut out the figure of an elephant in a drawing and pasted it on the map and made the borders of the elephant, the borders of one section, one region, one county. And that went off to the official Royal Cartographical Society. And up to this day, you can see in that particular atlas, the region that's defined by a cut out elephant. That is the sense that borders have. So it would be nice to, to be able to say that I I I I'm, I'm, I I become from from the from the elephant country. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
but uh, uh, some people say that uh, the writer's identity is actually uh, hidden uh, or is a part of his of his language. You you write mainly in in English, but as far as I know, you you wrote your 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 novels, your fiction in 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 Spanish. Um, English was my first language because again, to add to this complicated story. Um, I was brought up not by my parents who were very busy, but by a nurse that they contracted. And she was a German-speaking Czech nurse who taught me English. <laughs> so my, my first languages were English and German. English with a German accent and German <laughs> with a Czech accent, which I still have. And... Um, so then when I went back to Argentina, I, I learned Spanish, of course. And then in school I learned French and then uh, some other languages. And then uh, when I decided to write, the language that came to me naturally was, was English. That's the, the language that brings up first the words to name my thoughts. Um, but some time ago, I tried to write a novel that's set in a South American country, and I wanted uh, some quirks of language to appear. And it's very difficult. I, I, you must have experienced this. Um, to give a character um, a, a tone of vocabulary that belongs to a certain place in a certain time, and it's a nightmare for uh, translators. How do you translate into Croatian uh, a Dickens character who speaks with the English of one section of a London neighborhood? Um, but in order to avoid the problems, or part of the problems, I decided to write it in Spanish. And then I wrote another novel in Spanish. Um, but I translated them afterwards into English, one with, a, with the help of another translator. And of course, when I did that, then everything changed because um, part out of laziness, because you find sections that are just too difficult to put from one language into another, and you say, oh, you know, blast it, I will just change what they say. and. <laughs> And and so they, they are very different. It's a good advice for for, for translators. Uh, well, tra 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 translators, I think, are the underrated geniuses of literature. We wouldn't have world literature without translators. And I, I say that I read Dostoevsky or 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 uh, read uh, David Al Bahari or read Dante. I, I don't read them, I read the translators. And um, I think that the translator's name should appear in the cover in large letters and the writer's name in small letters. <laughs> Um, not a long time ago, I, I, I boasted to some people that I know two, <coughs> two great writers <coughs> of the 20th century, Alberto Mangel and, and David Grossman, who do not use e email or any electronic device. <laughs> and so when, when we began uh, talking about bringing you here, uh, I, I sat down and I wrote you a, pro a proper letter. Yes. When th there was a stamp on the letter, I hope. Absolutely, uh, yes, yes. Because otherwise it, it wouldn't travel. Yeah, well, it would travel, but I would have had to pay 25 cents. Yes, so which I, de I, I decided to pay for it myself. <laughs> That's very generous yes. of you. So, but, and, I was, and I was really surprised when I actually received your reply by email. Yes, I know. You know, um, the, the end of rhinoceros, UNESCO's rhinoceros, is one of the endings that I most love when everybody's turning into rhinoceros and around him, the character Béranger, and Béranger and saying, je ne capitule pas, I, I won't surrender. Well, I didn't have the strength of character of Béranger and I did surrender to email. Um, the problem is that 
you feel that if you don't, you're causing trouble for others, and my publishers make me feel guilty, and my agent makes me feel guilty, and journalists make me feel guilty, and finally I surrendered, and I have now email. Um, and I, I, I don't like it for a number of reasons. I don't like it because you communicate with um, a, a, a person who doesn't have a, a voice, a character. He doesn't have a handwriting where you can recognize a certain personality. Then uh, emails, as you have said, don't come with stamps. And since I was a child, I love stamps. Uh, they make you travel. And then um, I don't print out my emails, uh, and so archives are depleted. I made a donation some years ago of correspondences that I had with Doris Lessing, with Bioy Casares, with a number of other writers, and these are precious documents because uh, you see the hand of the writer on the page. But email has eliminated hierarchies uh, and it has become a form of communication that is essentially practical, but it has lost soul. Do you still collect stamps? Pardon? Do you still collect stamps? Um, I, I do, but not for me now, for the son of the post lady who adores me because I'm still the only one who justifies her job in the village. <laughs> well, next time we meet, bring this, your, du 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 your duplicates and we can, we can exchange them. Uh, good. Do you uh, collect I, I stamps? I still collect stamps, yes. Oh, excellent. Well, then I will think of you when I collect them and I won't give them all to the post lady's son. Well, you can give some. Don't, 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 don't all give right. all of them. I, I, collect, I collect especially the, the bird stamps. Bird stamps. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, yes. Well, then I will... There's a, a, a series um, uh, printed recently in Argentina, lovely bird stamps. Um, I'll collect them for you. Thank you. <laughs> we, we have all the, all, all the witnesses here that we need, so. <coughs> <coughs> you are often seen as uh, one of the last defenders of, of the book as, as, as an object. Um, not the not the last. Uh, I'm I'm one of very many, but we are not as vocal as the defenders of the electronic technology. Um, and what bothers me is that uh, it has become a question of opposition. Uh, book is object against uh, virtual text, and. As every technology, that the electronic technology has its virtues and uh, its advantages, um, except that I keep insisting that we should have the choice. And when we use one technology over another, we should know why we're using it and not use it if it's just imposed on us, as, the, as it is now, um, we don't need 400 gadgets. We don't need to change the, our printer every three months just because a program changes or plug breaks and uh, you can't use the old computer again. Um, all of these things serve no one but the industry. The, the Romans had a wonderful, useful question in law, which is cui bono? And I think we should all ask ourselves that question every time we do almost anything, which is, whom does it benefit? Whom, if, if I have a, a portable phone, which I don't, uh, and uh, the 400 gadgets and three computers and so on, 
whom does it benefit? Does it benefit me? Does, does it, do I really need this? I still can't understand, and I know that, that I am a dinosaur here. Um, what is the need of portable phones uh, unless you are, you're traveling to some place that you might run into an accident or you are a brain surgeon? Um, I, I'm astonished that 99% of the population is so important that they need to be reached 24 hours a day. Um, <laughs> however, uh, with the, the book as object, there are certain advantages, and with the electronic text, there are, the, there are other advantages. And depends on what you want to read and how you want to read and uh, what information you're looking for, you choose one or the other. And libraries have, since Alexandria, not consisted only of books, or in the case of Alexandria, on scrolls or tablets. They had objects, they had maps, they had uh, different ways of, of presenting the text, they, they were much more eclectic than what we are imagining now, which are, I have seen them in North America, libraries that are like graveyards, where you don't have books and you just have screens. And then at that point you can ask yourself, well, why go to a library at all? Why don't you consult that virtual library at home? Why, why would you go to a place that's empty except for screens? But this is a question that we should ask the bosses of Apple and IBM and so on. It's interesting that when you, when you, when you mentioned the historical moment uh, in the Library of Alexandria and you said that there were tablets and, and scrolls, it is the same as if, as if you say now that, that there are tablets because that, that we still use something called ta ta tablets. Yeah. And and and, and <coughs> when you when you use computer, it, it, it's actually a, the scroll of of of, of absolutely of paper. So but we we are nostalgic. You know, um, I, I, if we can get a little bit technical now, um, I always found it surprising that. Two of the societies that are at the root of most Western societies are the Hebrew society and the Greek society. And there is a paradox in both. The, the Greek society that communicated um, in every aspect of its daily life, in writing it, documents, letters, plays, novels, uh, signs, it did not hold the book as a central symbol. It, it's, it, the symbol of the Greek society was in its stones, in, it, in its monuments. The Hebrew society, or the Jewish society, uh, that held its communication to be mainly oral um, and was, of course, nomadic, held as its symbol the book, the Bible. And I'm not sure whether our society today has not gone back to the idea of the central symbol being the monument in stone or in, in plastic, because my computer, every time I open it, I have the sense that I am in front of a something like a Greek temple with the cobblestones of the, uh, uh, the keyboard in front of me that allows access to that screen. Uh, with rituals like religious rituals uh, designed by bluffs that I will never know. Um, and so uh, we, I think, have abandoned the notion of the book as being central, and we have this little desk monument 
that has become the essence of our society. But I don't know for how much longer. I mean, I'm told now that there's a technology that's being developed um, based on the chips implanted in the brain for that allows blind people to to see, well, to see, to apprehend the outside reality. And those chips will eventually allow us to um, have uh, texts implanted in our brain in the same way that you um, select books on your Kindle. Instead of your Kindle, it will be a a chip in your brain and you would select text that would come to your brain. I, I don't know if that will happen, but uh, certainly the technology that we are living in now will not be the last step. I wouldn't want to have a chip with Harry Potter. You, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you can choose. and you can, you can choose Shakespeare or Paolo Coelho, whatever your mood is in the afternoon. Um, but, but we always believe that the technology we have is the ultimate technology and that it overrides all technologies. And, and what happens every single time is that <coughs> the new technology declares the old technology dead, like when photography declares painting is dead or film declares theater is dead and uh, video declares that film is dead and so on. It, it, it's all, all a, a, a death that are announced uh, prematurely. And, um, but what really happens is that both vo uh, technologies interact and one technology borrows the vocabulary from the previous technology and the previous technology uh, is fed by the new technology and we see theater that is fed by film and, and uh, f painting that is fed by photography and so on and, and um, in the world of the book we have gone back to finer editions of the book that are um, redeemed, in a sense, through contrast with the uh, virtual technology. So, e-books are here to stay? E-books are here to stay, or real books are here to stay? E-books. E e-books will disappear, as publishers are already telling us, and there will be something else. But the, the object of the codex is, I think, one of the very few perfect objects that humankind has invented. We have invented a few things that cannot be bettered, like the blade of a knife. If you have a thick blade with a knife, it's not better. If you have a, a blade with a different shape, it's not better. The, the blade that was invented in prehistory is uh, perfect. The wheel, you can invent a, a square wheel and I think that designers were always keen to put new uh, taps in the bathroom shower so that when you go to a hotel you can't tell how to turn the shower on. Um, they will do something with the wheel, but the wheel in itself is perfect. And the third one is the codex. The codex is a perfect object that uh, allows you to interact with it. You can open it on any page. You can read uh, forward and backwards. You can mark a chapter. You can write on the margins. You can carry War and Peace in one volume that fits in your pocket. And it preserves the hierarchies given to it through the kind of printing, the kind of paper, the kind of binding, which the virtual text doesn't have. In the virtual text, uh, a newspaper and a Shakespeare play look exactly the same. Um, so I don't think it will disappear unless we decide that we don't want something that is excellent, that is perfect. The square wheels that you mentioned <coughs> remind me of square watermelons. 
That's the point. Yes, I, 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 there was a story going on about um, Israelis in the kibbutz trying to have hens lay square eggs so that they would fit better in the boxes and travel better. But I don't know that they have succeeded. The hens, hens were against it. The hens were against it, yeah. yes, yes. Because it, it, it involved, um, it involved the different, different pro process, so. Yes, m more labor and less pay. Yes. But now I want to ask you something, something else, something about, about the, the, the reading itself. Uh, how, how, how do we read and, and how should we read? How do we read? We read in many ways, and there is no should in 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 reading. Um, it is an activity that does not belong in a totalitarian vocabulary. Uh, you can't tell someone how they should read or what they should read, because the relationship of a reader and the text. Um, is an intimate one that cannot really be explained. Um, I, I marvel at the miracle that any one of you who walks into a library, uh, you can guarantee that person that on the shelf is a book, a paragraph, a page, that was written exclusively for you, that, that contains your deepest secrets and your um, most hidden fears. And these are put into words by someone who didn't know you from a different culture, but that, that page is there. And, and, and that is the miracle that readers look for. Um, I think that uh, reading is a very curious activity because when we invented reading, and we invented reading before we invented writing, because you can't invent a code that is to be deciphered before you invent the way of deciphering it. So reading curiously comes before writing. But when we invented that, we invented a way of doing away with the two main obstacles of human existence, which are time and space. There, there is a, a letter found in Sumeria from 5,000 years ago, and it moves me deeply because the letter says, um, I received your message and I am writing to you now to tell you that I felt as if you were here in my presence and not far away beyond the mountains. Reading can do that, can bring the presence of someone who is far away beyond the mountains to us, but also um, from far away in time. Francisco de Quevedo, the great Spanish poet, called reading conversation with the dead. And it is really a conversation with the dead. The dead are alive in our uh, bookshelves and we can converse with them because in the conversation we change the book that we are reading. Um, and these are miracles that you can overcome time, you can overcome space, just by opening a book. Um, I, uh, I know that in every society, the proportion of readers is very small. Um, and that's why reading is accused of being an elitist activity. But it's an elite to which we can all belong. Um, however, in a society like ours, all our societies, <coughs> where the values are what is easy and what is quick, an activity that is difficult and slow is very difficult to redeem. When, when we wonder, 
why we say, and this is not completely true, that young people don't read. Well, why should they do what everything in society tells them that they shouldn't do? Um, you won't sell a, an electronic gadget or a bottle of Coca-Cola saying that it's difficult. You're not going to sell it saying that it's slow when it takes time. So those values that are imposed on us make that this essential activity, which is reading, which gives us words to name what we don't know we know, is uh, an activity for which we have to, to fight um, in order to survive as, as human beings. Well, uh, another question concerning reading. Do you think that reading can make us better persons? Uh, everything lies in the can. Yes, I think that reading can make us better persons. I think that reading can alleviate suffering. I really think that reading can provide consolation in our daily misery. But uh, you can't force a book to make those things happen. Um, it, it, it depends largely on us, on how willing we are to uh, look for the right text, to look for the right words. Um, it, if, you, if you have a feeling of, of anguish, as we all have, and wonder um, what it is that you're feeling, what is this black cloud that you're feeling over you, and you come across a poem by Emily Dickinson that says, Presentiment is that long shadow on the lawn indicative that suns go down. A notice to the startled grass that darkness is about to pass. Now, when I come across those verses, then something has happened to me. It, it my anguish is laid down in words, and for me, it's easier to handle. Now I want to ask you a question uh, regarding uh, short stories. As far as I know, you don't write short stories. No. Well, I've written I've written a few. Um, I, I, I've written a few, but I find um, that the short story um, is a very very difficult form, and. <coughs> To succeed in writing a short story uh, w without writing a condensed novel is is very hard. Um, and because I I admire so many short story writers and so many short stories, I I have always felt that my short stories fail in being a short story. But you 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 have edited a, a large number of of of, of short stories, yeah. so it it must be. I don't know. Maybe 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 you're doing it because you're not you're not writing them. Well, I um, if the truth be told, I never wanted to write anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> as an adolescent, I wrote a few things, as every adolescent does, and and then very quickly I realized that. Uh, none of this would be as good as the, the books that I loved. And so I decided, well, why bother? Why uh, Jorge Luis Borges said that a writer writes what he can, but a reader reads what he wants. And I thought, 
why give up this extraordinary generosity of reading? And so um, I decided that I would be very happy just being a reader. But what happens is that, as all you readers know, that even if the act of reading begins as an intimate activity with just yourself and the book, um, as soon as you find a text you like, you want to share it. You want to share it with friends. You want to tell people to read it. And so when I came to Canada, and I wanted friends to read stories that I had read in other languages or that I had discovered from English writers that weren't enormously known, I decided to put together anthologies so that others could share those stories. And, um, and so, yeah, I, uh, this were, these were some of the, the first books that I published. And, and I can say that they were wonderful because they weren't mine. They were the stories that I loved of other people. But there are so many of them, and I just want to mention a few of them. Some of them were really influential as, as far as my, my reading of short stories is concerned because I, I learned about many, many previously unknown, unknown writers. There's the famous anthology Black Water, the book of fantastic literature. Well, then... I'm just, I just, I'll just mention a few. Other Fires, short fiction by Latin American women. Uh, then the Oxford Book of Canadian Ghost Stories. You love ghosts. I, I, I like ghosts, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like fantastic literature much more than the literature of fantasy. I, I, I like what, um, in English, you call the uncanny, the... Uh, the supernatural, the 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 story where uh, nothing is impossible, uh, but something strange has happened. Well, I I I I love stories like Kafka's Metamorphosis, where the only. Uh, fantastic element is the first sentence that after a night of restless dreams Gregor woke up and found himself transformed into a giant insect but then once you have that line everything else is of the most rigorous realism I like those stories but I also think that that, that, that first sentence is a, is a perfect short story for itself. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, yes. And, and there are stories that boil down to that one sentence. There is a Central American short story writer, Augusto Monterroso, who wrote a story which is, became very famous, and it's just one line. It says, when he woke up, the dinosaur was still there. And I just mentioned uh, several other anthologies. The Gates of Paradise, the anthology of erotic short literature, and then the second Gates of Paradise. Then, uh, meanwhile, in another part of the forest, gay stories from Alice Munro to Yukio Mishima. Yes, that, that we, uh, I did that with uh, Craig Stevenson, and uh, we very much wanted the subtitle uh, for gay short stories that it it wasn't stories written by writers who were gay because I I think that the merit of the writer is to uh, have an imagination that allows him or her to uh, imagine these other characters. So we wanted writers from Alice Munro to Yukio Mishima um, so that the reader couldn't say, oh, well, these are all gay writers. No, they're all gay stories. So there, there, there are others, but I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't have to read all of them. I mean, no, they're, they're, no, they're, no, for goodness they're, sakes, they're, no. They're, they're, there are too many, too many. Yeah, yeah, yes. too many. And uh, I, I love the title of your, of your novel, uh, Todos los hombres son mentirosos. Yeah. All, 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 all men are liars. liars. 
Yeah, uh, that was a novel that I started to write when I arrived in Canada in 1982, and then I left it aside and finished it uh, 20 years later. Um, it, this was a novel that I, I wrote in, in Spanish because I wanted several different Spanish voices. So there was a Cuban voice, an Argentinian voice, uh, a Spanish voice, a voice from somebody um, who lived in different parts. And, and so the, the Spanish language is different in each case. <coughs> and, um, and I tried to do that in English and it was too complicated. So I wrote it in Spanish. Uh, and then I had it translated, and then I revised the translation. But um, but the title comes from uh, uh, from the Bible, and I said in my folly, all men are liars. So that if you read the title, it seems that you're saying that all men are liars. But if you read the quotation, you understand that uh, there is uh, uh, a doubt introduced. I said in my folly, all men are liars. And it's, it's a novel about um, the impossibility of capturing an event in the past um, that if you have a number of people talk about the same person, describe the same event, you will have uh, a number of of different versions of that event of that person, which is a very old conceit, of course. I have two 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 final questions. I mean, what, what the first concerns the first concerns uh, your opinion of of, on, of of Canada. You said uh, somewhere that uh, when you when you arrived in Canada, uh, for the first part, you, you, uh, you felt that you were being uh, in a place where you could participate actively as a writer in the running of the of the, of the yeah. state, this is what what many writers dream of, dream dream of in Eastern Europe. So, yeah. how come you you came across that in in West? Um, as most things that you discover, it ends up being uh, largely an illusion, but. I arrived in Canada having lived in Argentina, having lived in Italy, having lived in different places where you can't pronounce the word democracy without an ironic tone. Um, and arrive in Canada and suddenly confronted with a state that is offering you participation uh, in the running of the state at all sorts of different levels, whether it is school committees or neighborhood committees or so on. And also that uh, you are in a country that doesn't try to impose its notion of identity on you. In, in France, a few years ago, they created the Ministry of I, in immigration and national identity. This sounds like something out of Nazi Germany, where um, they wanted to come up with idea, an idea of what was French. Um, well, Canada had a great advantage over the other countries of the Americas. It is the only country that was not born from a revolution. It was born from a counter-revolution. They wanted to stay English. Um, fortunately, they didn't. But um, with this idea that you are not b born from a, a violent change comes a notion of identity that remains constantly open. And I had certain experiences upon arriving in Canada that for me marked the best of Canada, the best of any society that I could imagine. For instance, at one point there was a large community of Sikhs who arrived in Canada as immigrants. and. Uh, acquired the Canadian nationality. Now, um, 
you know that the Mountie or the Mounted Police is the most visible symbol of, of Canada. It's uh, uh, equivalent to a Venetian gondolier. You, the, the red uniform, the hat, the boots, etc. Well, a Sikh wanted to become part of the Mounted Police, and as a Canadian citizen, you can. But you know that a Sikh cannot take off his turban in public. So it's part of the uniform. So any other country would have said, well, then you can't become a member of the Mounted Police. In Canada, they changed the uniform. And they said, uh, a Mounted Policeman can from now on wear a turban instead of a hat. Uh, that is what I mean by open identity. However, there is uh, another side to this. There is no society with, without prejudice, as you well know. And um, a number of times, this, this prejudice has welled up against the natives, against the foreigners, against uh, Muslims or Jews, for instance, in, during the Second World War, when the Canadian uh, immigration minister was asked how many refugees uh, would he take from uh, uh, Nazi Germany, his answer was, none is too many. So these things are also part of the reality of Canada. However, because there is in place a structure that is against prejudice, that is for the citizen participating, I still say that I am Canadian. I give that nationality as a Can nationality I have chosen because I don't believe in arranged marriages. <laughs> we'll sing the Canadian anthem. Yes, together in French and English. Uh, yes. The Canadians would be delighted. I don't know the words in Serbian. <laughs> well, we'll practice them first. <coughs> I just want to end this with, with the, with the. I just want to 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 end 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 our conversation with the with the statement from from Robert Louis Stevenson, who is. Obviously, one of your favorite. Absolutely, right? he's a good friend. And uh, <laughs> he said, uh, "For my part, I travel not to go anywhere, but to go. I travel for travel's sake." And I, I hope that this this travel that you made was not only for travel's sake, but it was uh, for for the sake of meeting all these good people in Buxa and and seeing you again, David. Thank you. This was the main reason to come to Zagreb. Thank you. Thank you. Follow them. Thank you. Alberto Mangel, who still believes in books, so when you when you come back home tonight, take a book and read it and think of Alberto. You can think of, of me as well a little bit, but <laughs> so. Um, but now uh, Alberto um, is uh, willing to 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 answer some of your questions if there are any questions. Um, I know it, it is. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> David says, admit it. Um, not as much quarrel as they have uh, fiery dialogues. Um, so on one hand, uh, the Italian side 
will have a, a, a passionate dislike of something and the Canadian side will say, uh, well, look at the good aspects of this question. Uh, so these are the dialogues that, that happen. However, um, because I don't have to swear allegiance to any of those parts, I think that what I do is I pick from the different parts things that I like. So uh, I, I, I like the Argentinian sense of friendship. I like the Canadian sense of society. I like the French admiration for culture. Uh, I like the Italian sense of beauty and so on. Um, so out of all those things, I think that I can create a puzzle that more or less resembles me. Yes, please. Uh, well, it's a question that may, you may have ex expected. Well, um, we know that you have been one of the readers to Jorge Luis Borges. <laughs> so um, I would like to know maybe uh, a bit about that. We know that, that Borges was blind for a large part of his adult life, so maybe a bit about that experience. Um, yes, I, I did my high school in Buenos Aires, and when I was about 14, I wanted to earn some pocket money, so I phoned the different English and German bookstores in Buenos Aires and see if I could work for them. And I got a job in one of the bookstores, which happened to be the bookstore where Borges would come to buy his books. Now, this was in the early 60s, Borges had become blind in the mid-50s. Uh, it was a, a blindness he had inherited from his father, so he knew all his life he would be blind. And uh, his mother, who was almost 90, would read to him, but she obviously got very easily tired, and so Borges would ask all sorts of people to come and read to him. And uh, one day he asked me if I would come and read to him, and so uh, for uh, almost three years, I went every evening to his house to read to him. But um, it was not the kind of reading that you would expect when you say that one person reads to another. When Borges became blind, uh, he decided that he wouldn't write any more prose. Uh, he would continue to write poetry because he said poetry came to him as a music to which he added words and then he could dictate those words. <coughs> but um, to write prose, he said, you had to see your hand write. But writers make these decisions and then fate makes others. Um, during those years, Ideas for stories came to Borges, and when he met me, it was a time that he had decided that he would try to write those stories. But as a wonderful craftsman, and he was really a professional craftsman, he wanted to see first how the stories that he admired were written, had been written. Um, stories by Henry James, by Kipling, by Stevenson, by Leon Blois, and so on. <coughs> and so, um, without telling me why, he would ask me to write, read certain stories. But um, when you read for someone, you read with a tone, with an interpretation. He didn't want any of this. this he wanted a, a, a clean reading. Um, which he would interrupt constantly after two lines, after three lines, because he would make comments. He would say, oh, how interesting that uh, Stevenson puts this word here, and he will use this word three pages later in a different context, and the reader will remember it. Or he would uh, remark about Kipling. Um, he introduces this hesitation 
in order to make the reader believe that he's more intelligent than the writer and so on. Um, so I became, as many others, the, the, the witness of his reading. The, there are not many occasions to be in the presence of a reader because when we read, we keep those comments to ourselves, but just because I was there, he felt that he would should do those comments uh, out loud. And so I spent three marvelous years learning to read. Um, I started reading Borges in, in school. He was on the curriculum, but in very soon afterwards, he became one of my personal loves. Um, I think that for anyone who is interested in reading, Borges represents the, the classic reader, the, the person who discovers for you um, old laws that existed forever but that no one has expressed before or no one has expressed so clearly before. <coughs> when Borges writes Pierre Menard, author of Quixote, which is a story, if you haven't read it, that is written like an essay. It's uh, an essay that describes a French writer from the early 20th century called Pierre Menard, whose intention is to write the Quixote again. Now, not to copy it, not to translate it, to write it again. And um, so Borges goes through this process, and then in the end he shows how uh, a paragraph written by Menard compares to a paragraph in Quixote. And of course, they are the same paragraph. They, they, they have the same words. And it's um, a paragraph that is uh, in praise of history. So uh, he says, history, um, uh, whose mother is uh, truth, etc., etc. Um sorry, uh, truth whose mother is history, et cetera, et cetera. And Borges says uh, that written by Cervantes, it's a mere rhetorical uh, praise of, of history, but written by uh, Menard in the early 20th century, it's absolutely revolutionary to say that history, that truth is what we say about truth, that history is not what happened, but the story that we tell. And we are in a part of the world where this must resonate for you. But um, when Borges writes that, the reader realizes that this is what we do all the time. Our interpretation changes the text. Our reading changes the book. Um, the the most important element in the history of literature is not the writer, but the reader. Because, yes, the writer has written magnificent things, uh, Cervantes, Shakespeare, but it is the reader who has recognized the difference between the place of Shakespeare and the place of John Smith, and has said, I will stay with the plays of Shakespeare and I will discard the ones of John Smith. But somebody has to make the choice and somebody has to keep adding levels of reading to the text. And this is one of the many things that Borges did. And also he, was, he re, re, gave the, the Spanish language new life. Spanish, Spanish as a language had, had um, uh, frozen in the 19th century, and Borges broke all that in, uh, in, in, a, in a language that every writer after Borges cannot ignore. 
Well, we have time for one more question. <coughs> if there is a question, yes, please. Also yes. his analysis of the Middle, East, of Middle Ages, uh, of the writing from by the hand, actually before, to the master. So I would like to hear what you think of uh, even English. And uh, <laughs> his last two books were published in Canada. We do have the yeah. testimony of English yes. without the Canadian radio programs and the editor that actually published those last two books, Conversation with Illich and uh, Testament. Um, you ask a very difficult question because um, I uh, I don't have the text present in in my mind except to say that uh, he was of enormous importance uh, both as a critical thinker but also as someone who anticipated the conflict between manuscript and printing, printing, and whatever would come afterwards. Um, I think that one of the uh, Illich's observations that for me was, was very important was uh, how he uh, made us remark that at the moment of the invention of printing, uh, handwriting, writing by hand, uh, came it into its own that it needed the new technology for a recognition of the value of what we had before. And this was proven because <coughs> among the most successful in Cunabula, the, the books printed in the first 50 years of printing, were a collection of letters because people were going back to writing letters, but now knowing that they were doing something that seemed uh, in danger. And so uh, handwriting manuals, correspondence manuals, the collections of the letters of Cicero and so on. Because this is in our nature, we don't notice many things until they're almost gone. Well, thank you, Alberto. I would like to thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you for coming here and and uh, sharing uh, your, your thoughts with, with, with all of us. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that this will be one of the evenings that will always be remembered in books. Thank you. Thank you.